So, after a series of videos regarding countries far and wide, I decided to do one much closer to home. The historical relationship of Czechs and Slovaks, two nations that shared a state for much of the 20th century, and their mutual similarities and differences are deeply fascinating to me. I have wanted to do a video about this subject for a long time. To somehow start, I will try to outline my personal relation to the matter at hand. As most of my viewers know, I am Czech and I was born after the breakup of Czechoslovakia. But like many Czechs, I have significant personal connections to Slovakia. My maternal grandmother was born in Slovakia, even though her family moved to the Czech part of the state when she was a child. My paternal grandfather was a lifelong soldier in the Czechoslovak People's Army and as such, he served in Trenčín in Western Slovakia. My dad thus grew up in Slovakia for a part of his childhood. However, my most significant connection is that my wife is from Slovakia and therefore half of my family is Slovak through marriage and my son is half Slovak. I just spent quite a lot of time in Slovakia, observing the country, speaking with the people and trying to grasp its character, so to speak. Now, the story of Czechoslovakia really is quite unique since it was a state that was created purely by utilitarian fiction. This fiction was the claim that something like a Czechoslovak nation existed. But there never was such a nation. There were always two separate and very distinct nations, Czechs and Slovaks. These two nations were both Western Slavic and had very similar and mutually intelligible languages. However, apart from that, their historical trajectories and roots are indeed very different. For a thousand years, the territory of contemporary Slovakia, with its Slavic population, even though it would be significantly premature to call this population Slovak at the time, was part of the Kingdom of Hungary. This multi-ethnic state stretched out through the Pannonian Basin on the crossroads of Central, Eastern and Southeastern Europe and, for centuries, constituted one of the edges of the civilization defined by Western Christianity. Geographically, Slovakia was a natural part of this space, since it formed its northern mountain border and was tied with it through the Danube River. The territory of the contemporary Czech Republic, historically usually called the lands of the Bohemian crown, which I will call Czechia in this video because it is the shortest possible name, was, on the other hand, part of the Holy Roman Empire since the 11th century, so also for almost a millennium. German-speaking Central Europe was the primary window to the world for Czechs, especially those living in the largest and most populous region of Bohemia, since it was connected to the Germanic Europe through the Elbe River. So, the context in which these two nations have developed has been quite different. Even even though both countries were part of the Habsburg Empire, they were in different parts of the monarchy. Czechia was part of Cisleitania, the western and northern part of the state ruled directly from Vienna, while Slovakia was part of Translitania, or the Kingdom of Hungary, ruled from Budapest. While Austria-Hungary was one state, since 1867 it has been a dual monarchy, and the two parts of the state were almost independent, except for the Monetary and Customs Union, federal budget, and matters connected to foreign policy and military affairs. The legal systems were, for example, very different from each other. In general, the Cisleitania was significantly more developed and industrialized than the Hungarian lands, even though it also included the rural Galicia. Until the First World War and the creation of Czechoslovakia, the two nations did not share common history. Their histories were asynchronous. Most important historical events throughout Czech history had very little or no impact on Slovakia, and vice versa. Czechs and Slovaks also differed in their family types, with Slovak families being significantly more clannish. And yet, the two nations became almost irreversibly connected in the eyes of the world in the 20th century. How did it happen? Many European nations underwent some form of national revival movement, usually in the 18th and 19th centuries. These usually included codifications of the languages, so they can be used in higher education, science or literature, as well as new interpretations of national histories that were usually full of smaller and larger manipulations used to paint the histories of the nations in a glorious light and prove their ancient roots, as well as undisputable and ideally exclusive claim to the land they inhabited. Czechs were at the forefront of this process. During the 18th century, it was very well possible that the Czech language, and thus also basically the Czech nation, since the modern national movements are first and foremost defined by language, might disappear 
and get dissolved in the German sea that surrounded it from three sides. That was not happening primarily through forced Germanization, but simply through social forces. The majority of cities in the country were overwhelmingly German speaking, as was basically all the intelligentsia and the urban merchant classes. Czech was the language of the countryside, small towns and outskirts of some larger cities. If one wanted to become educated and make something of himself, he needed to go German. The truth, however discomforting it might be for many, is that many, if not most of the traditional and beautiful city centers of contemporary Czech cities were built and inhabited primarily by Germans until relatively recently from the historical point of view. While the territory of Czechia was one of the first in the monarchy to properly industrialize and 70 to 80 percent of the industry in the whole Austria-Hungary was in Czech lands, it was overwhelmingly owned by Germans and the German-speaking Jews. Prague did not become a majority Czech city until around the middle of the 19th century. Throughout the 19th century there was a massive urbanization wave caused by the demographic transition slowly starting to take off in the Czech countryside and the rural populations started to relocate to the cities to take on jobs in the growing industrial sector. In combination with the language revival propelled by the romantic 19th century nationalism, the urban Czech intelligentsia and petty bourgeoisie began to form. These social group thus formed a core of the modern Czech national identity, which is based on the middle class bourgeoisie and was defined by anti-German sentiment and anti-clericalism. The anti-clericalism of the modern Czech national identity is a phenomenon that needs some context to be understood. Throughout the history of the Czech lands, several religious movements revolted against Catholicism, mostly the Hussite movement and the revolt of the Bohemian noblemen that started the Thirty Years' War. The Hussite movement was a Czech proto-protestant movement formed in the 15th century, since the Hussites were primarily Czech and fought with the German-speaking Catholic forces of the whole the Roman Empire, the Hussites were an absolutely perfect fit for the national revivalist narrative about the thousand year long struggles of Czechs with the Germans. Also the suppressed revolt of the Bohemian Protestant noblemen, most of them Hussites by faith, against the Catholic Habsburgs and the subsequent recatholization of the Bohemian aristocracy were very easily integrated into the interpretation of history, presenting Czech history as a never ending competition with Germans. Czechs thus accepted the interpretation of their history, in which the Catholic Church, which was by far the largest denomination among the Czech population, is connected with Austria as an oppressive German power, even though the Austrian Empire was not all that oppressive in the context of the times. And the Czech lands, as well as the Czech nation, underwent massive flowering under the rule of the Austrian Empire. Czechs could have their educational institutions, cultural institutions like the National Theatre or National Museum, and access to bureaucratic jobs. The Czech national identity thus never became connected with some particular religious denomination, as was the case with Poles, Slovaks or Croats. Many main intellectual and political figures of Czech national life, like František Palacký or Tomáš Garek Masaryk, were evangelicals. Still, the mass of the ordinary people mostly remained Catholic. When Czechoslovakia was created after the First World War, the Czechoslovak Hussite Church was formed, a national protestant church in a manner similar to many northwestern European protestant countries. The Czechoslovak Hussite Church got a relatively solid following, but it was mostly a patriotic state-building project rather than a religious fervor that was behind the church's growth. During the communist period, when the regime suppressed all religions, the main drivers of the opposition in Czechia were secular intellectuals like Václav Havel, who was a playwright. There is a massive difference in comparison with Poland or Slovakia, where the main opposition was always connected to the Catholic Church. Today, the Czech Republic is one of the most atheist countries on the planet. As usual, Moravia is slightly different. It remained more solidly Catholic throughout history and the influence of the Hussites and Protestantism was significantly less pronounced there. To this day, the remaining footholds of Catholicism in the Czech Republic are in Moravia. But overall, the biggest problem for Czech nationalism and the political movement that strived for either bigger autonomy of Czechia within the Austrian Empire and later for an independent state was clear. The approximately 3 million Germans living on the territory of the historical lands of the Bohemian Crown that had no reason to support either Czech autonomy or Czech nation state. Since they did not want to become a minority within state dominion by Czechs. The Germans were concentrated in the peripheral mountain regions of the country, bordering Germany and Austria, while the Czechs dominated the relatively flat interior. The Germans represented a puzzle that was very hard to figure out. Czechs wanted their own state, and they wanted it within its historical borders. But within those borders lived millions of Germans, who made the Czech claim on the territory based on the right to national self-determination 
a very tough argument to sell. But without the territories inhabited by Germans, the theoretical state would be an indefensible rump, and Czechs felt that they would lose integral parts of their ancestral land to the Germans. That is why Czechs needed Slovaks. The emancipation process of the Slovak nation started much later and was significantly less developed than the Czech one, when the First World War caused the disintegration of Austria-Hungary. Slovak intelligentsia was scarce, Slovak urban classes were almost non-existent, and no Slovak high schools or universities existed. The Hungarization pressures were very strong and quite successful, especially after the dualization of the monarchy in 1867. Slovak national culture organizations like Matica Slovenska were banned, and the existence of the Slovak nation as such was denied. The danger of language assimilation that Czechs managed to avert throughout the 19th century was still very well alive in Slovakia. Those who wanted to gain an education and thus join the elite were forced to adopt the Hungarian language. In 1910, Slovaks comprised around 14% of the population of Bratislava, their future capital city, while Germans and Hungarians comprised both around 40%. Nobody, of course, called the city Bratislava at that time. It was either Presburg in German or Pozsony in Hungarian. The second largest city of Košice or Kasa in Hungarian, was approximately three quarters Hungarian in 1910. Slovakia is a very mountainous country, with only the southwestern and southeastern parts being flat extensions of the Pannonian Plain. Those territories were primarily inhabited by ethnic Hungarians, while Slovaks predominated in the more mountainous parts of the country. Since educated Slovak classes were scarce, a lot of the political leaders of the Slovak nation in the final decades of Austria-Hungary were Catholic priests, for example Andrej Hlinka, one of the most most essential Slovak political figures of the 20th century. If the core of Czech modern nationalism is urban and secular, the core of Slovak nationalism is rural and Catholic. To this day, Catholicism plays a very significant role in the public life of Slovakia, which is one of the substantial differences in comparison with secular Czech nationalism. Another critical difference is the position of pan-Slavic thinking in the mental maps of the two nations. One of the most influential figures of the Slovak national revival movement was Ludovic Štúr. He was a politician and and lexicologist, who codified the modern Slovak language in the middle of the 19th century. In every Slovak town and city, you can find his statue or a school named after him. He won second place in a survey searching for the greatest figure in Slovak history. He was a panslavist and a avid Russophile. Panslavism and Russophilia were quite common among the nationalists of Slavic nations at that time, since Russia was perceived as the only sovereign and strong Slavic country, not ruled by someone else, which was true in the 19th century. Ludovic Štúr openly advocated for the merger of Slovakia with Tsarist Russia. And even though he codified the Slovak language, he also proposed that all Slavic nations should use the Russian language. He also wholly rejected Western Enlightenment, democracy and liberalism, which he saw as a natural precursor to revolutionary communism. While a certain tradition of Panslavism and Russophilia was also present in the Czech tradition, it was significantly weaker. One of the most important figures of Czech national life in the 19th century, Karel Havlíček Borovský, also started as Pan Slavist, but then he actually spent a year in Russia. He came back and rejected Panslavism, since he rightfully understood that Russia is a backward country that definitely cannot serve as a civilizational inspiration, and also that Panslavism is just a tool of Russian imperialism. Under Russian rule, the Slavic nations would have been no more free than under any other rule. But to be fair, and to give credit where credit is due, when Stur said that liberalism would lead to some form of revolutionary communism, completely dissolving the social fabric of society, well... In the long run, the fella might have been onto something as well. The echoes of these two approaches can still be felt in the public life of the two nations today. Czechs wanted first autonomy within Austria-Hungary and then, when it became clear that Austria was becoming subservient to the German Empire, they wanted their state. As I already mentioned, the issue was that within the desired territory of that state, there were approximately 6.2 million Czechs and 3.2 million Germans. Tomáš Garik Masaryk, Czech politician and then the first president of Czechoslovakia, soon understood that the nation's faith after the Great War would be decided abroad, and he thus left his homeland and headed to the West. There, he lobbied and tried to persuade the politicians on both sides of the Atlantic about the necessity of creating the Czechoslovak state. The idea of a common state of Czechs and Slovaks was not 
not entirely new. The concept had existed among the national circles for quite some time. The issue was that among Slovaks, the concept really gained traction only among relatively narrow and specific strata of their intelligentsia. It was mostly people from the Slovak protestant circles that enthusiastically accepted the vision. People like Vavro Šrobar, who often spent years in Prague and were under the influence of the humanist thinking of Tomáš Garik Masaryk. The protestants in Slovakia always used Czech in their liturgy and thus felt that the nations indeed share a language and should develop together. But the vast majority of Slovaks were Catholics, who either did not know the ideas of Masaryk or, if they did, did not really identify with them all that much. And while I love the first Czechoslovak Republic the same as every proper Czech lad, It is an undeniable truth that Masaryk and his colleagues lied a lot when persuading Western politicians. They for example claimed that the best road to peace in Europe is the creation of three new smaller Slavic states on the eastern border of the Germanic world, since Slavs are natural pacifists without any inclination whatsoever for ethnic violence. However, the main argument that the Czechs used was the right of nations to self-determination. American President Woodrow Wilson was quite a fan of this concept, and thus it was not that hard to persuade him, especially when the Czech and Slovak communities in the United States helped. But there still was the problem with the Germans comprising a third of the population of the Czech lands. What about their right to self-determination? It does not make much sense to have a nation-state in which the most populous nation, the Czechs, comprise around 50% of the population. What kind of nation state is that. So, to boost the numbers of the main state-building nation, the idea of Czechoslovakism was invented. Masaryk and his companions basically thought that the western politicians did not know that much about the region and they sold them the idea that Czechs and Slovaks are and always have been one nation. And voila, suddenly two-thirds of the nation state's population are of the main ethnic group. Czechoslovakia was thus created as a truly multi-ethnic state, with approximately 51% of the population being Czech, 24% German, 15% Slovak and the remaining 10% comprised of 750,000 Hungarians, almost half a million Ruthenians, almost 200,000 Jews, 75,000 Poles and also some Romanians. According to the official state interpretation, 65% of the population was Czechoslovak. Czechoslovakia has a huge role in the Czech national myth as a wealthy, developed and democratic republic in the heart of Europe, increasingly surrounded by dictatorships from all sides during the interwar period. But the state was doomed to fail. The biggest issue was that it was an unhistorical multi-ethnic state that Czechs were leading as, first and foremost, their own. Czechoslovakia was our precious creation, the culmination of the Czech national revival, which finally reached its climax. But the state was full of people who did not share this story. It was not theirs. Germans, Hungarians and Poles had their states just across the border. As for Slovaks, they were never satisfied with the status quo within Czechoslovakia. Since Slovak intelligence was lacking, Czech police officers, bureaucrats, teachers, postmen and so on flooded Slovakia. In a couple of years, homegrown Slovak intelligentsia began to grow up and felt that the Czechs should make room for them. The Czechs thought Slovaks were ungrateful, since many of them saw the relocation to Slovakia as a sacrifice towards the new state. Slovaks wanted autonomy within the state. They wanted to be equal with Czechs, but Czechs never really accepted it. The argument was that if we granted Slovaks autonomy, how could we justify not giving it to the Germans? Slovakia was always governed from Prague and Czechs held a very paternalistic view towards Slovakia, seeing themselves as a force of civilization in the underdeveloped East. This approach understandably triggered Slovaks. Edvard Beneš, the second president of Czechoslovakia, stubbornly repeated, quote, nobody will ever persuade me that Slovaks are a nation, end of quote. They believed their own lie. A lot of Czechs, even today, think that Slovaks should just be grateful, since we saved them from the Hungarians. But the truth is that when the end of Austria-Hungary was becoming inevitable, Hungarians offered Slovaks autonomy within a federalized state and many Slovaks, possibly the majority, would prefer it over Czechoslovakia. These issues plagued the state for its entire existence. There was always a disconnect between the federalists, the so-called Prague Slovaks, a narrow class of Slovak politicians, bureaucrats, intellectuals and artists who supported the common state and lived in Prague, and the majority of people living in Slovakia. When Hitler finally broke up Czechoslovakia, Slovaks 
created their independent state as a German satellite. While Czechs tend to see this as an act of treason and a case of Slovaks standing on the wrong side of history, the reality is more complex. Slovak politician Josef Tiso, a Catholic priest of course, was invited to Berlin, where Hitler told him that if Slovakia did not declare independence, they would support the Hungarian military in conquering the whole of Slovakia. So it was not much of a choice. The state was sort of proto-fascist and it did export Jews from Slovakia into German concentration camps. So there is no point in idealizing it. Still, it also showed Slovaks that they could function in their independent state and that the standard of living for the common person was far from catastrophic in the context of the times. It would be beyond the scope of this video to describe the whole history of the Czech-Slovak relations throughout the 20th century. So I will try to point out the most important stuff. Slovaks rose against Germany and the state leadership during the Slovak national uprising, which was crushed but nevertheless became a crucial event in Slovak national history. The communist regime in the first two decades of its rule was, once again, very centralist. Slovaks again strived for more autonomy within Czechoslovakia. They wanted federalization. One of the crucial years in the history of Czechoslovakia is the year 1968, when the Warsaw Pact armies invaded and occupied the country to counter the pro-democratic changes taking place within the state. For Czechs, the year 1968 is synonymous with the occupation and it constitutes probably the deepest root of the anti-Russian sentiments within the Czech population. However, there was another thing that happened in 1968. And that is the fact that Czechoslovakia was federalized, which was the climax of the years-long struggle of Slovak communists for more autonomy. So, while for Czechs the year 1968 is just a purely negative historical event, it is somewhat more ambiguous for many Slovaks. The invasion of 1968 is not perceived with the same level of severity in Slovakia as in Czechia. Conversely, the federalization in 1968 is something that the average Czech likely has no clue even happened. In my personal experience, the whole communist regime is perceived differently in Czechia and Slovakia. For Czechs, the 40 years of communism meant gradual degradation of their economic development level from being part of the rich and developed world club in the interwar period to being on par with many Latin American countries in the 1990s. It also meant the breaking up of cultural ties to Western Europe and the broader Western world, something that many Czech cultural elites could not bear since their aspirations always aimed to the West. In contrast, Slovakia objectively underwent significant economic and civilizational progress during the communist period. While Czechia has been an industrial country since the end of the 19th century, Slovakia has been largely an agrarian country, well into the middle of the 20th century. Slovakia had an industry before communism, but just much less of it. The communists decided to massively industrialize Slovakia, partially because communists just wanted to industrialize everything, but also because Slovakia was further removed from the potential war front on Czechoslovakia Slovakia's western border with West Germany. Strategic industries like weapon manufacturing were thus located primarily in Slovakia. Slovakia was also urbanizing fast, since in 1950 only a quarter of the population of Slovakia lived in cities, while in Czechia it was already well over half at that time. My wife's grandmother had her two children in a wooden village house without running water or indoor plumbing in central Slovakia in the 1960s. When her family moved to a new commie block apartment with all the luxuries of modern urban housing, it was an undisputable civilizational progress. When one speaks with older Slovaks, their view of the communist regime is thus often more conciliatory. The number of Slovaks who claim that life was better during communism is much higher than in Czechia. That is not because Slovaks would be convinced Marxists, but just because the number of people experiencing clear socio-economic progress was significantly higher there. During the entire period of the common state, there was never a Czechoslovak society. There were always two separate ones, Czech and Slovak. Czechs have always perceived Czechoslovakia as their state and their project. The development in Slovakia was an afterthought for them. They never tried to understand it. The development in Slovakia Slovakia was a secondary part of Czechoslovak history for Czechs, while for Slovaks it was the main story. Slovakia was seen as the younger brother, the beautiful holiday destination where some people also happened to live. Czechs were thus, once again, very surprised when one of the first things that happened after the fall of communism was Slovaks striving for independence. As usual, they had not seen it coming, since they were ecstatic about the Velvet Revolution, Václav Havel being president and the Rolling Stones taking pictures with him during their prime concert in 1990. Why are Slovaks coming up with this now, when everything is going great? They are really ungrateful, since the money has always flowed only in one direction, from Czechia to Slovakia. Nobody is oppressing them, they are doing good. 
good. However, the Czechs were also doing well under Austria, and yet they wanted more autonomy and independence. It was not about the material condition, but about the symbolic recognition of one's identity. The reality is that people in modern times overwhelmingly perceive nations through states. Nations with their own states are much better known than nations without them. The world associated Czechoslovakia with Czechs, Czech history and Prague. Deep down, Slovaks knew they wouldn't achieve the symbolic recognition they desired as a modern nation within Czechoslovakia. The division of the state was significant in two aspects. First, the majority of people in both Czechia and Slovakia were against it, according to sociological research. But that is only half the truth. People in Slovakia and in Czechia have imagined very different things under the term common state, even if they claimed they were for its continuation. Slovaks have often claimed they want the common state. But they also wanted to have two central banks for the common currency or for Slovakia to be a subject of international law. Such demands were inconsistent with the existence of a common state. Czech Prime Minister Václav Klaus wanted to push through the economic reforms as fast as possible after the end of communism. He wanted Czechoslovakia to be an economic tiger and an example of successful economic reform that would make him a historical figure. These reforms were quite popular in Czechia, but much less so in Slovakia. He thus did not really try to stop the dissolution of the state. Václav Havel, the humanist intellectual and playwright who became the president of the state, was adored in Czechia, but much less so in Slovakia, where he was seen as a Prague candidate who did not understand or care for Slovakia, which was kind of true. It was a very passionate and motivated minority of Slovaks that really pushed through the idea of Slovak independence, since they wanted it much more than the others wanted Czechoslovakia to continue. Czechoslovakia was an artificial state and, as such, did not inspire sufficient passions. The second crucial thing was that it happened in complete peace, without blood. That is indeed a historical achievement of both nations, even though it is true that it was made easy because there were not any population exclaves and the border was historically clearly demarcated, unlike in Yugoslavia. The ease with which the state was divided shows that the two parts never truly became one. Before getting into what I perceive as the main differences between the two nations, I want to outline the commonalities. While clearly different, Czechs and Slovaks are still comparatively very close to each other, compared to nations from various parts of Europe or the wider world. The most important commonality is obviously the mutually intelligible Western Slavic language that both nations have. People often tend to underestimate the impact of language, but it is of course completely crucial and none of the things I am analyzing in this video would have happened if the languages were not similar enough to justify the claim that the two nations are actually one. Since the country spent most of the last century in a common state, the people share a massive number of common cultural references, especially the older generations. However, the music, film and television industries are still partially connected even today. Both countries are relatively low trust societies, compared to Protestant Germanic Europe and the Anglosphere, but that is mostly a testament to the uniquely high trust the Germanic Protestant societies historically enjoyed, at least until recently. The impacts of mass immigration changing the demographic fabric of these countries on their social trust will likely be significantly negative. However, I feel like the low trust in Czechia and Slovakia primarily concerns citizens' relationship with the state and its institutions. Throughout their histories, both nations very often lived in states they did not consider their own. Whether Austria-Hungary or communist Czechoslovakia, most people have not really identified with these states. And this distrust towards the public sphere, represented mostly by politics, continues even into the democratic era. Corruption is thus relatively prevalent in both countries, since people often do not recognize that taxpayers' money is everyone's common property that should be used for the common good. However, as usual, the countries are relatively corrupt compared to the remarkably uncorrupt northern European countries. In comparison with the broader world, it is nothing terrible. Looking at the voter turnout in the European Parliament elections by country, you can see that Czechia and Slovakia are almost always at the absolute bottom. The nations likely share the perception that they cannot really change anything in the functioning of the EU. So why bother? I have used a lot of comparisons with the Protestant German European countries countries, usually showing their superiority in interpersonal trust or corruption. But it always has two sides. The Protestants strive for perfection, 
for the constant betterment of the world and moral purity also has its darker aspects. The whole woke insanity of recent times is, in its essence, a protestant phenomenon. When you look at where it comes from in its most robust forms, it is almost always from historically ultra-protestant regions, such as New England or Scotland. Nazism was also primarily a protestant phenomenon. Protestant countries are uniquely economically efficient and possess a high level of social cohesion and trust, but they can also get lost in utopic, delusional quasi-religious visions of the world. Both Czechs and Slovaks share a fundamental distrust of these utopic recipes for brighter futures, which is a good thing in my opinion. Both Czechs and Slovaks overwhelmingly reject mass immigration from Africa and the Muslim world, since they just quite logically see it as a source of trouble that they do not want. They have enough of their problems already. One Czech sociologist recently concluded that the rejection of Muslim and African migrants is probably the only thing that Czech society can agree upon. In some fundamental sense, there is a level of fatalism and skepticism, maybe even cynicism, that is common for all Slavs or Eastern Europeans. The world is not perfectable, you won't change it. Why try? You might as well get completely shitfaced instead. Which is another thing common for both Czechs and Slovaks, as well as most other Eastern Europeans. People here drink a lot. And the women in both countries are absolutely gorgeous even though I think Slovak women come out on top. Economically, both countries are heavily industrialized, with the automotive sector being the most crucial for their economies. The differences I will discuss should make sense in the historical context outlined in the previous chapters. Slovakia is significantly more rural, religious and conservative. Slovakia is still one of Europe's least urbanized countries, with only 54% of the population living in cities. In the Czech Republic it is 75%, and in most Western European countries it is well over 80%. Slovakia is less urbanized than Nigeria, Indonesia or Azerbaijan, that very much influences the social and political landscape of the country. Rural populations are more traditional and conservative, and Slovakia is no exception. One quarter of Slovaks attend church at least once a week, while in Czechia it is less than 5% of the population. The influence of church and religion is thus comparatively much lower. Meeting a Czech person who is seriously engaged with religion is really rather rare. I know many young Czechs who have never been to mass, while even young Slovaks usually have some basic religious education and often still go to church at least a couple times a year. While in both countries there is a clash between the wealthy, pro-western and liberal large cities and the poorer, more conservative peripheral regions, this disconnect is, in my opinion, much more pronounced in Slovakia. Looking at the map, you can see that Bratislava, the capital city, is on the westernmost tip of the country, right on the border with Austria and just 60 kilometers from Vienna. The city is literally as western as it could be in the context of Slovakia. The further east you go, the poorer the regions are. The economic development in Slovakia thus follows the logical west to east gradient and Slovakia is one of the most regionally unequal countries in the EU. If you live in the part of Slovakia where you can drive to Austria within an hour, you are likely significantly better off than if you can travel to Ukraine within an hour. The contrast between the capital city, which is by far the wealthiest in the country, and the rural, poorer and conservative rest of Slovakia is very stark. Since you still have authentically conservative, religious and nationalist political forces in Slovakia, and they likely comprise a majority of the population, the liberal progressives are all the more fierce, since they know they are a minority and act more defensively. In the Czech Republic, the basic paradigm is different. Prague, the capital city, has a much more central geographic position within the country. While also obviously the wealthiest region, the whole interior of the country is relatively prosperous and the poorest parts are the border regions where Germans used to live, the Sudetenland. The Germans were expelled after the Second World War and a diverse group of people from the whole of Czechoslovakia repopulated the region. The region's human capital suffered a huge blow since the Germans had lived there for centuries and had deep roots. From the socio-economic point of view, the region have never completely recovered, even though the expulsion of Germans was a great accomplishment from the point of view of Czech statehood, which is a subject for a separate video. Czech politics are significantly more centrist than Slovak politics. The rural slash urban divide is much less pronounced and the conservative slash progressive divide is also much less stark. There is very little genuine extremism from any side. If politicians claim they want to do something radical, like leaving the EU and NATO, you do not really believe them. Czech elections tend to usually end up being about money and state expenditures. It often makes the politics of the country rather mundane. Czechs are liberal people. 
but they are not progressive. They are equally skeptical of Catholic morals, flag-waving nationalism and vogue nonsense. They mostly seem to want peace and to be left alone in relative prosperity. But ultimately, Czechs perceive themselves as Westerners. While they historically defined themselves against Germans, they basically always wanted to have what Germans have, their own wealthy and industrial country. Only in Czech edition. In Slovakia, significant portions of the population seem relatively ambiguous in this regard. Slovaks are much less anti-Russian and much more anti-American than the Czechs. And the current conflict in Ukraine really showcases this. The position of the two countries regarding the current conflict is as far from each other as possible. Which is an interesting phenomenon. I have outlined the historical roots of this divide in the previous chapter. But to somehow conclude, the pan-Slavic, eastward oriented and anti-Western sentiments are just much more appealing to Slovaks than to Czechs, who always saw themselves as essentially Westerners, even though with certain Slavic characteristics and many reservations towards the hyper-liberal Western tendencies. Interestingly, while many Slovak nationalists tend to hate Hungarians, Google Jan Slota quotes for an undiluted dose of pure Slovak anti-Hungarian hate. The country's politics seems to be relatively close in many aspects, and they are getting even closer. One of the specifics of Hungarian politics throughout the modern period is a tendency for leaders to keep their position for a long time. Miklos Horty ruled for 25 years, Janos Kádár for 32 years, and Viktor Orbán is now Prime Minister of Hungary for the 18th year and counting. Throughout the 1990s, Vladimir Mečiar was the Prime Minister of Slovakia for 8 years out of 10, and since 2006, Robert Fico has been Prime Minister of Slovakia for 10 years out of 18 and still counting. Slovaks like strong leaders. According to some sociologists, such leaders that embody the authoritarian archetype of a rural farmer echoing the relatively recent rural origin of most Slovaks. Czechs seem to prefer sleeker, little dull bureaucratic types that look like they could work in a bank or something. Just some solid middle class person who will take care of stuff. I already mentioned the expulsion of the Germans from Czechoslovakia after the Second World War. The logical outcome of this event is that Czechia became a very ethnically homogeneous country, without significant ethnic minorities except for gypsies. In Slovakia, there are half a million Hungarians living in the southern regions adjacent to the Hungarian border, and there are also many more, possibly also around half a million, gypsies. Slovakia is thus a multi-ethnic country. The inter-ethnic relations with Hungarians are another additional interesting layer of Slovak politics. While both nations have tendency for alcoholism, Czechs are massive beer drinkers, while Slovaks prefer spirit. According to the categorization of family types by Emanuel Tot, Czechs belong to the authoritarian family type, together with most of the Germanic world, while Slovakia belongs to the communitarian family family, which it shares with the majority of the post-communist countries. So, even the historical family type kind of reflects the different orientations of the two nations. The communitarian family type is characterized by the preference for authority and equality, since in this family system all sons share the inheritance equally and live with their families under the father's authority, comprising a clan of sorts. It is true that when one watches Slovak politics, the combination of redistributive economic policy and strong leadership style indeed looks appealing to Slovaks. So that is about it. I hope we will manage to survive many more centuries next to each other brothers. Different, but very close. If you finished this video and hopefully found it interesting, I just want to once again ask for your support on my Patreon. Researching and making these videos takes quite a lot of time. I will level with you guys. The amount of money from YouTube ads isn't exactly a fortune. And with my current view counts, getting paid promotion to my videos also is not all that easy. Some time ago, I made a tier on my Patreon that is just $1 a month. That is like half of what a beer costs in Czech pubs nowadays. So, if you enjoy these videos and would like me to continue making them, please consider this form of support. It would mean the world to me. Thank you very much.